Welcome attendees. Thanks for signing on on a cold January night. Um, I'm Andrea Nunez, manager of the uh, Office of Human Trafficking Prevention. We will do some full introductions before, so uh, just hang tight for one minute. We have a welcome video we'd like to show you from our county executive. Human trafficking is a crime that requires more than just good effort and intention to combat. For Howard County to be the best county for all, we cannot let our most vulnerable residents slip through the cracks. This long-term work is capably led by our Office of Human Trafficking Prevention in our Department of Community Resources and Services and Human Trafficking Prevention Coordination Council. In recognition of Human Trafficking Prevention Month, I'm proud to join our partners for a discussion about a great episode in the PBS Frontline documentary series, Trafficked in America, which investigates how a group of Guatemalan teenagers became victims of labor trafficking in an agricultural setting in Ohio. This documentary is vital because it focuses on labor trafficking, which traditionally isn't gotten the media, public, and government attention that sex trafficking usually does in the U.S. Our work against trafficking will take all of us continuing to educate ourselves responsibly about what is and what isn't. I'm grateful that you took the time to watch and come together for this discussion, and I'm committed to not letting it be our last. We must and we will continue to protect our residents and their families from this devastation and holistically support survivors who have experienced the worst of humanity. All right, can you guys hear me again? Good, all right. Thank you, Becky. All right, we're going to shift into our uh, conversation. Um, so welcome again, everyone. Um, my name is Andrea Nunez. I am the manager of the Office of Human Trafficking Prevention at Howard County's Department of Community Resources and Services. Uh, so I, and I, and I'm joined tonight by a really awesome local immigration attorney and partner of mine, Alicia Altamirano. I'll let her introduce herself uh, in just a second. Um, just briefly, a little bit more about me, my role, why I, uh, you know, wanted to show you this documentary tonight. Um, it's a great uh, learning tool, I think, uh, easily for, for different uh, levels of, of uh, familiarity with trafficking and certainly labor trafficking. Uh, so my role, um, I'm a, you know, to be clear, I'm a civilian. I'm not in a police uh, role. I'm not in a direct service role to victims of trafficking, kind of in the middle, uh, trying to uh, just put all the pieces together as best we can in Howard County in terms of services, ensure that survivors of trafficking locally are getting everything they should to, to rebuild well and be served in, in every way. Uh, and then we do, I spend a lot of, uh, Brianna and I, I have Brianna uh, McNamara with me from my office here. Uh, she and I spend, uh, we'll always be spending a good chunk of our time on uh, community education, training, outreach initiatives, uh, targeted, sometimes very general, just, you know, different audiences trying to, you know, best we can teach a little better uh, about what sex and labor trafficking are and are not and what resources are available here in Howard County. Uh, so I will stop there and, uh, you know, our, our timing tonight, uh, we're, we're here till 8.30. We'll, we'll see how, how it goes, how, how many, the definite goal is to talk a little bit about this documentary and then also um, have a lot of time for interaction and questions. So we may, we may slide uh, beyond uh, 8 o'clock into 8.30 if, if, if folks would like. Uh, so we'll get going in just a minute, but I have a really awesome uh, co-panelist here with me tonight, Alicia Altamirano. I get to work with her on a few county fronts. So uh, Alicia, can you um, go ahead and uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Andrea. Hi, everybody. I'm Alicia Altamirano. I'm a local attorney in immigration and family law, but I also, I'm a very involved in the community. Um, I work closely with Andrea um, and my reasoning for being here tonight, apart from Andrea asking me to, which is, is a great honor, is because human trafficking, I think, is um, a subject in our communities that is taboo or unheard of or 
uh, the community doesn't believe that it happens in their neighborhood and human trafficking happens anywhere and everywhere. And there are many misconceptions to human trafficking. So I, I wanna do my part in trying to educate and spread awareness and communicate to everybody um, what the different kinds of human trafficking are, what people can do to get involved and how um, you can help in a human trafficking case. Well, so Alicia forgot to mention that the, I get to work with her on a couple official county bodies. One of the roles of my uh, office is we uh, support uh, this county's task force against human trafficking. It's called the Howard County Human Trafficking Prevention Coordination Council. Dr. Bob mentioned it very briefly. So Alicia is one of our members. She's been a member, active member for a couple of years now. Uh, she and I also have the pleasure of serving together on uh, the executive's uh, Latino, Latina work group. Uh, it's called La Alianza Latina, and I think I see one other, at least one other member here in the uh, uh, attendee list, um, but that's been a, you know, a different group, so uh, generally I uh, seek Alicia's counsel on a lot of uh, matters, and I think she's a great asset to, to all these, all these uh, pieces of the county's work. Um, so Alicia, tell us, um, you know, you and I share a legal background, but you've been practice. Tell us bit, uh, very briefly about the type of practice you do, you have right now. So I have immigration uh, slash uh, family uh, practice in Howard County, but I'm throughout the state of Maryland. I'm in a few different jurisdictions. And I've managed to carve out a little niche where I specialize in special immigrant juvenile status cases. And basically what that is, is assisting anyone under the age of 21 who is not married or and never has been married who has been abandoned abused neglected by one or both parents and due to that abuse abandonment or neglect they are un, uh, they're un, unable to reunite with such parent and it's not in their best interest to return to their country of nationality. So basically, it's a great relief, immigration relief for these uh, children or minors that come into this country and fit all of those um, elements. And it involves requesting from the circuit court custody orders as well as a special findings order. So it's a very long process. Uh, when I first started doing these cases, I could do a case in two years from, from my first consultation to their residency card in hand. And now it's taking anywhere from three to five to six years, but it's still available. And I do other immigration uh, processes to um, through USCIS or through the court. And the reason I do that is because I, I'm also an immigrant, a daughter of immigrants. And so I wanted to focus on this, on the immigrant population and uh, be of service to them. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, let's get going here and we'll uh, have lots of opportunity for conversation and questions, either for me or Alicia as we go. Um, so I want to just very, hopefully by now, everyone has watched the documentary on their Through the Canopy service, and uh, if not, don't worry, it's not going anywhere. You can still, uh, you know, hopefully listen and, and go back and, and rewatch or watch pieces of it later. Uh, we'll be happy to, you know, send out the link uh, again. I think if you're here, you have it already, though. So um, hopefully you've watched, and so we're going to talk through a little bit. It's a really, as Alicia, I think, said, it's really good illustration of how, how not always, but some labor trafficking cases can go down. Uh, so I'm going to really briefly, um, just in, you know, usually this kind of presentation, as Alicia and Brianna know, of Human Trafficking 101 can take like, it's at least an hour. So I'm not going to do that tonight. It's uh, just a very quick cliff notes, like one or two minutes overview of labor trafficking. Now that you've, you know, seen it teed up, seen it teed up in this documentary. So I'm um, going to share right here. Generally, um, and Elisa, I think we'll we'll add on her her expertise uh, whenever she'd like. Can you, someone give me a thumbs up? You can see, okay, Brianna, right? Thank you. Um, so generally, what we're looking for 
you know, and, and just kind of layman's term, not not heavy and legalese tonight, uh, and for a case, some a, a working situation to become labor trafficking uh, or or sex trafficking. But tonight we're focused on the the labor side of it. Uh, generally, what attorneys, law enforcement, service providers, what we're all looking for some, you know, whether it's under the federal law, the you know, our state law, different states have have some differences. We're always the, the key elements of trafficking. What makes it rise to that high level of exploitation is some element, some combination of force, fraud, or coercion. Those are come from the federal statute, um, and so really, in any case, you, you need at least one, you know, for for a, a winning case, an argument that a situation has become trafficking uh, under our laws. So. Um, you know, our, we're getting, there's no perfect list of these are the red flags. And if you see any of these, you definitely, you know, call the police right away. It doesn't really work like that in reality. As Alicia knows, a lot of these, especially involving, um, you know, people from other countries and different legal statuses, it can be it's really case by case. Uh, so, you know, this here is a really a strong organization. I recommend if you have interest after tonight, Polaris. Um, they run the National Human Trafficking Hotline. I, this from straight from their website. So I suggest um, you know checking out some of their modules if you have more interest. But these are some of the red flags, some of the ways that force, fraud, or coercion those those elements can 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 show up. That's how these are the kind of things that have been deemed by courts by law. You know, uh, in terms of our visa requirements, these are the kind of things that legally. Um, can amount to you know, force, fraud, or coercion. A lot of times, and the, like our documentary shows tonight, we don't really seem, it's easy to focus on cases where there's violence and force and you know, restraint of a person in trafficking situations. But a lot of times we, we don't have, we don't always have that. It can be fraud and coercion, other non-physical, non-violent uh, circumstances in that person's story or the group of people's story that amount to that can still add up to trafficking. So things like, yeah, you know, I won't read all these, feeling pressured to be in a job, but you may want to leave. Owing money, the second check mark's huge. We definitely will we'll be seeing, you know, we see that. Uh, no control of their identity documents or passport when they're immigrants often. Isolated, uh, monitored, certainly bad living conditions we see sometimes and being threatened, deportation or harm either to them or, or to a family working in dangerous conditions. So um, let's, uh, I'm gonna stop there. Any um, quick questions um, on this before I move on? Okay. I don't hear any, let's see. Stop my share. Okay, all right. So with that frame in mind, it's, uh, you know, I'd love to just try to take the example we, uh, these that we saw in this documentary and try to talk it through a little bit um, where you think the force, fraud, or coercion were in this story of these, uh, you know, immigrant teenagers, you know, who ended up in Ohio on this chicken egg farm. Uh, so I will, again, we, we have the benefit of, of just the 20 or so participants here. So I, for those of you who are looking to part, maybe unmute and participate, you're welcome to, or you can do so via the chat if you're more comfortable that way. Um, but uh, we, we'd, we're happy to have this be an interactive, you know, teaching conversation. If anyone would like to um, take a stab at these, some of these questions that I'll, me and Alicia will put out. And if not, Alicia and I will, we'll just start talking through them. So my first question for everyone, is um, again, what do we see in this case, this story that you think were the force fraud or coercion that made this whole this whole documentary, this whole story rise to that higher level of labor trafficking? Does anyone have any um, guesses of what uh, what were those key factors in this case? So Andrea, can, can I? Briefly, maybe assist anybody that has a has a comment and is not sure. So, labor trafficking. The definition is when someone recruits, harbors, transports, provides, or pains a person for labor or service through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of involuntary servitude, debt, bondage, slavery, or punage. So maybe that'll help you with your comments. Okay. 
That's all right. These virtual conversations are always harder. It's easier in person to, uh, you know, answer questions like in a classroom setting. All right. Well, Alicia, let's you, you, you and I and Brianna work through this one. Okay. So the work here we see, uh, you know, we see labor is really hard, strenuous labor in this chicken setting. We hear about 11 to 16 hours a day concerning his, uh, we see a lot, you know, and you really compelling is the uh, footage of that, the, the, the living situation, right, Alicia? Inhumane living conditions, right? Right. Um, I thought it was pretty, yeah. Yeah, it was a really interesting to hear from that woman who bought the trailer later, talking, you know, just pretty candidly, you know, talking about her impressions of, you know, whoever was living there before her. Um, I thought, so, okay, so we're looking for force, fraud, or coercion. What elements, Alicia, did you see uh, that, that sounded, you know, like they rise to the, you know, the levels that we care about, either force, fraud, or coercion in this story? You want to want to start with fraud? Was there anything, yeah, in the story? So, um, one of uh, examples of fraud are false promises. And so the family, they were made false promises. And so that would be a fraud for uh, the process, which is one of the elements of traffic. Exactly. Right, they, um, uh, right. we go back to Guatemala and, you know, I thought it was really compelling to see the home, you know, we don't get to see the very beginning of the story, right? And we hear the trafficker, yeah, and Lynn, you're totally right. Uh, it sounds like the trafficker himself visited those, just knocked the doors of, you know, the houses and conversation about, you know, and, and uh, you know, the way I often explain fraud to people is it's just lying, you know, boils down to they were lied to, right? You're saying, you know, they thought they, he mentioned, we hear in the documentary that they uh, were told about like school, you know, 15, you know, for $15,000, you get to come, great, you know, the job, but you'll opportunity to go to school. Right. And then, it, in, you know, through, yeah, exactly, Lynn, promise of, uh, and, I, and Alicia, how common, you know, you do a lot of work with immigrants who, uh, you know, coming to, to a job, to work is a bit, often a common thread and, and just many immigrants' story, right? And is this, how common would you say that, it, not always trafficking, but, you know, how common would you say that backdrop is? Unfortunately, it's um one of the main reasons for why the immigrant comes to the United States is because they live in such poverty. There is no opportunity to get out of the po poverty. And they've heard all these great stories of living in the United States in America. So they want to come here to not only help themselves, but also help their family members, um, especially juveniles. They want to help their parents. They've been living in such poverty where sometimes they don't have food to eat. They go to bed hungry often. Um, they live in um, conditions that, you know, would be neglectful if those conditions were provided to a child here in the United States. Um, and there's also the threat of violence for a lot of these um, juveniles. And so but coming here for labor opportunity is one of the main motivators for them to leave their family, even, even for some people who are living in such poverty, leaving their family is a deterrent. But you're offered here a job and you can go to school and you just pay this much money and then he'll pay it back and it's all good. That's, I think, the biggest part of, of this lie is that they, the trafficker knows uh, it's not as smooth, smooth as he's uh, right. putting it to the, to the families. Right. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. Yeah, and thank you everyone who's chiming in in the chat. I see a lot of right answers. Yeah. Yeah, I think the fraud is a strong, I suspect, you know, argument for prosecution here that it was just, I've, you know, I haven't done as many trafficking uh, TV says probably as Alicia has, but I did yeah some back in the day and it was like this it was very you know very similar facts and it's up you know the it just think about it you know too in america like you you you, you they didn't the immigrant didn't get what they bargained for they said yeah i'll come and i'll work at this job i'll go you know and it'll be fifteen thousand dollars and then we get the deed back like they agreed basically there was an agreement uh and then it when they get here it's completely changed and you know uh so i think that's uh that's where the, the focus is for fraud. 
uh, let's see what else there. Yeah, we. I thought it was pretty. I think it was so cool that they, you know, this documentary took the time to go to Guatemala and, you know, track down, you know, invite those families to to share their views and. You know, one of those, the dad early on says, yeah, that, you know, the son, yeah, he was eager to go. Yeah, I'll go, you know, e you know, so that can be really hard to like process as a, you know, non, you know, an American or someone who just doesn't do this work, right? Like where did, what, well, you're saying he's trafficked, but he wanted to come, right? He, you see his dad said, yeah, he jumped at the chance to, you know, go to the U.S. And um, so that's where those those elements of fraud and coercion they come in because it, the situation really changes from where he did say yes a young person but they right. said yes well and, and, and the counter argument to that he wanted to come is it's you know I'm sure it happens I I've actually I've seen it happen where the trafficker says I'm taking you to the United States to um, bring in and sell illegal drugs and if not, I'm going to kill you. Yeah, that happens. That was clear cut. But in this case, and then I think this is why these elements were provided because most of the victims, they don't know they're being trafficked. Or at least not yet. Right. Especially not at the beginning. Right. 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 And so that's why they allowed for this um, element of fraud, force, or coercion. Coercion. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think Lynn, uh, you had it right early on the deed, the deed arrangement uh, on it, you know, I think right in, you know, on that property in Guatemala, you know, exchanging the deed to, you know, to secure the 15,000 debt. I don't think right there it was coercive. So then I, you know, that, I think that's a huge factor in this case. It's a very, I think a, a big piece of the coercion. Uh, it seems like they were like, yeah, sure. Here's, here's the deed. You know, we don't see that, you know, we don't hear too more about that. Maybe it was uncomfortable. Maybe they didn't, you know, really want to give it up, but we don't, we don't see that. But then later on, um, it does seem to me that the, you know, trafficker, you know, it, you know, if those boys were to say run away from that situation in Ohio, but, you know, their parents would still lose their home property and be homeless. So it does feel that seemed to be very, to me, I think to be a very key form of coercing that young person to stay, you know, stay there. He mm -hmm. makes that situation work. So I think you're, you, you all are doing a great job of identifying some of the, the factors here. Promise of a great job. Yeah, fed once a day. Yeah, I mean, the conditions are, are pretty tough. We see, uh, I think they do a good job of showing us that. I think, um, Alicia, yeah, one of the first things I, I would, you know, we saw it on that slide, the red flags often for, uh, not always, but a, a tra an exploitative workplace can be, you know, when we see those really long hours, no breaks, we just start to see any, you know, basic labor law in Maryland or the U.S. violated, you know, that you should be paid, you know, a certain wage, you should have time off, you should have breaks, you know, these things are in federal, state, and sometimes even local law. So uh, I think that, yes, it's a, it's a flag for me, the, uh, and then of course they're minors. Go ahead, Alicia. Andrea, another uh, trafficking indicator is they weren't able to refuse the demands of their employment. You remember when they were able to get out at a certain hour, but then they were told, no, you have to wait till midnight to get off of work and they had no choice but to stay there and work right so that's another indicator is when they're not able to refuse requests of employment right. yeah this this case is unfortunately a very good one there was a whole lot of uh problems it wasn't just one element of the exploitation i think it's a great example of how they all add up pile up to each other and then in totality you know made it really coercive made that made it be trafficking uh, kathy I, th I think you're kathy jordan there yeah you, you're getting it just right with your comment there that uh yeah you know sometimes that minor alicia hit this on the head all right minor does want to come initially and then the you know changes when they get here it's a really common thread i think in a lot of trafficking cases uh yeah, threat, Sarah Cochran, you're right, threat, yeah. And then we, we did hear, you know, in this case, as you're starting to identify here, so again, it's forced fraud or coercion. Now, if we had, we didn't, we don't see in the documentary, um, we don't see direct threats of violence, I think, against the team. Like, I will kill you if you don't wake up and come to work right now. We don't seem to, I'm not sure, maybe it did happen, but it wasn't, didn't seem to be shown. We do see, I think Sarah's right, we hear about 
you know, an indirect threat, you know, which I think can, can be the coercion for us, you know, that yes, if you, if you leave, if before your debt's paid, you know, yes, there's that deed that, you know, maybe your family doesn't get back, but also a quicker threat, you know, dad, you know, we'll, we'll shoot dad or other threats to family members at home. So yeah. I'm going to uh, just read the federal definition for part of it, part of it for coercion, where um, threats of serious harm, and that goes to what you just said, it's any harm, whether physical, non-physical, including psychological, financial, or reputational harm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in immigration, um, we have to be very creative. And it can be argued definitely that this is um, psychological also harm uh, because it's, um, look what it's, you know, we're going to shoot your dad. You know, yeah. I think somebody said right. two times who said that, that that's what they remembered that was yeah. rent to the absolutely yeah. that's right mm -hmm. yeah i mean at the end of the day a trafficking victim certainly these young men it sounds like all need a kind of their psychological harm too from all of it and they need a whole bunch of uh clinical and you know therapy counseling for a long time because of things the threats like that maybe no one was hurt physically but there's a lot of psychological harm absolutely um Okay. All right. Well, so again, that's really, you know, that those are the kind of things you have to think about whenever, you know, you're presented with a, uh, you know, any kind of fact pattern, you know, the, the exercise I tried to take us through a little bit, um, you know, just, just kind of in layman's terms a bit, force, fraud, or coercion. Those are the things that make a case of a bad workplace or a bad, you know, any other type of situation rise to that highest level of exploitation where it becomes maybe federal trafficking or, you know, an immigration relief or T visa. T visa is the visa, the name trafficking. It's kind of where it comes from. T visa, that's the name of the visa that the, a lot of trafficking victims once they're in the US uh, are eligible for. It depends a little bit on the facts. Like Alicia could take us through that in a little later if anyone's interested in the, the differences. There's T visas, U visas, and then she's specialist in the, you know, a, a youth uh, special category for youth. Uh, all right. So, did anyone, uh, you know, I think one thing to I'd love to focus on is just how um, isolated this, these trafficking victims were. And that's it's often a threat. If, you know, we see them in what appears to be a rural town, these trailers, um, that's, that's usually by design, I think. And they were on, it appears like the company owns the trailers, you know, the employer arranged for everything, the trip and, you know, and then the, this is where you live and then this is where you work all the time. Uh, don't, I, I didn't catch in there. I don't, we don't know for sure, but it doesn't appear that these boys were going to school. Uh, and in some situations, we do see that trafficking victims working uh, after school, really, really long hours. We hear from that teacher in another town later uh, about those th those types of situations. But it appears the boys in, a, in Ohio on that egg farm were not, it's not clear that they, they were in school. I, I think they were not based on the hours that they were working. Um, but did anyone catch what? So they were isolated, very hard to reach, right? And families very, very far away. Uh, did anyone catch what it was that actually you know, kind of broke through and got them out of their situation. What was uh, the straw that, you know, broke through as we see it in the documentary? Anyway, and I realize I think maybe you guys can't talk. So just, yeah, chat away, please go. That's fine. Um, I apologize. I, I missed that. Yep. There you go. Lynn, Sarah, good job. Right. So we don't know how he got that cell phone. I mean, this is a common theme, you know, a lot of you know, a lot of times, at least I'd welcome your uh, feedback. We see, you know, immigrants uh, in Maryland, you know, can quickly, if they're able to get to a store, buy like a simple prepaid cell phone and have the ability to make calls, even if they aren't, even if it's a little bit difficult. But somehow, we don't know how much phone access they, how much access to internet or phone that these uh, workers had, these boys had. But somehow, um, you know, one day, some privacy away from, you know, all the uh, exploitative managers or, or workers and was able to make a, you know, what sounded like an incredibly pivotal phone call to a, you know, relative far away in Florida, right? Um, I think it's, uh, you know, the trafficking case, Alicia and I, I welcome your comment on this. I've, the making a phone call, I think it is, is a pretty common fact pattern for, a, you know, victims of trafficking have a lot of different scenarios, but that is in my experience and uh, is, is 
can be very often what, what gets through. It's just a phone and the ability to make a phone call and, you know, the phone, right phone number for someone. What do you, what do you say to that, Alicia? Yeah. I mean, I, I've encountered this also with people who've been um, held for ransom on their way here to the United States and a cartel um, takes them and holds them for ransom. It's a phone call. That's the, that's the communication. So it's not, to, they don't, from what we can see, the boys didn't have access to transportation, to, you know, from the living cars. I don't think they had cars. Right? Other people, because um, supposedly they were there working by themselves and maybe the trafficker was the only one supervising them. So that phone call is pivotal. And that, you know, that, that young man was brave enough to mm -hmm. call his, um, was it his uncle and say, you know, we need, I need help. You have to get me out of this situation. Yeah. And, and to know that this isn't right. Because another part of trafficking, right, is, is they don't know. They were brought here from, by the traffickers and put in this position. And they don't know what's available to them. What they know is that they're undocumented here that they owe money, their family owes money, they're being threatened, uh, they were lied to. So they don't know if anyone's gonna help them, believe them. And so it was good that he was able to make contact with a family member and get that, that assistance. I'll, I'll sound the alarm with the uh, sheriff there in Florida. Right. And, you know, it was, she, I'm, I'm assuming she has some human trafficking training because she, she didn't hesitate. Right. She moved immediately to get um, the help that that young man needed to get law enforcement there. Right. I found that like a pretty satisfying, like happy part of the story. Like it's all, that's what you want every time, you know, hopefully it's just not, unfortunately, not always the case that law enforcement can, can jump on every tip, you know, right away from uncle who called it in or, yeah. you know, but uh, in this case, the best case sounds like it appears from what we see that it was a very rapid response and involving the feds we, we were definitely over state line that looks like so I think uh, that part was cool that would be you know the way it could you know if a phone calls me to a to a trusted adult or you know we have hotlines national there's a national human trafficking hotline there's a lot of Howard County our service provider has their own hotline to turn around you know there's a lot it's usually a good phone number so whichever call happened it's wonderful that it was uh followed up on so quickly mm -hmm. um that's right yeah and it is cool that that uncle uh you yeah, know that's you know that's uh, that's didn't get wasn't scared to call call law enforcement so, i mean it's a real we, we don't know the uncle's background maybe the uncle is american born or documented or not but you know certainly in the immigrant community there's fear of, of involved distrust of law enforcement um, so I think it's, yeah, I think it's great that he, he just picked it up right away and that they respond, appeared to respond really, you know, in a good way right away. Uh, let's see, some great comments. Keep them coming, guys. Um, um, Mr. Mr. and Ms. Monteith, I will, I will get to that. It's a great question. Trafficking is a big issue everywhere in the U.S. It's definitely an issue in Howard County. We have the stats definitely to back it up. So it's, uh, we chose this documentary night because it's a good illustration of, of you know, it's kind of like a case study. Um, Sarah said that they might not know that their treatment is illegal here in the U.S. That's a big part of why these traffickers are able to traffic so many people. Is you, they don't know, you know, they don't know what's illegal. They don't know what kind of help they can get. Absolutely. Great questions, guys keep, and, and gals. Keep them coming, Jorge. Yeah. Uh, in short, yes, teachers get some training on human trafficking. That's one of the many things that like, I think about and our Alicia and I, our Howard County Human Trafficking Prevention and Coordination Council work on. We have a member, a senior member of the school system represented there. Um, and we talk about this kind of thing. And the, yes, our, our goal is to regularly train all the people that are close to trafficking in Howard County. Uh, police trains uh, themselves really well. Uh, we know that they're they're one of the uh, really great police force here in Howard County. 
Uh, we have at my office, Brianna and I spent some good time implementing more training for fire and rescue who had never received that training before. One of the first jurisdictions in the state to do that. Uh, and then yeah, schools have been trained in trafficking before, uh, but we, we've taught, had some good conversation about re-upping that. And uh, we've had, uh, we definitely work with schools, law enforcement in my office sometimes, and our service providers uh, when they suspect trafficking. Uh, the PPWs, the, you know, kind of like this counselors, there's non, sometimes a non-teacher support staff are really well positioned to, uh, to, to see things that are concerning in a, in a child's story in their life and uh, to hopefully react appropriately. They are mandatory reporters. That's usually the, the first thing uh, they must do. Um, so let's get, I'm going to quiz you all a little more since I'm getting participation. I mean, so we see, yeah, like that the phone call is pivotal for this one of these boys in Ohio. What are, we see a lot of the other classic circumstances that make it very hard for them to get help and talk to people. You know, we, we it, you know, it can be easy to say, well, why didn't they just, if it was so bad in that awful trailer where they were living, right? They're forced to live. Why didn't they just run away, right? Why didn't they just run and, you know, look for the first, you know, so it looks like they don't speak English. I think it's a pretty good guess at, at that point. You know, so just try to find someone friendly or run to police to man and, and just just escape, right? It doesn't seem like that's part of the story. There, for a lot of good reasons, this is often how the fact pattern looks, I think, in these rural settings, why it can be hard for them to exit it, hopefully. So what are, what are some of the other things, circumstances you think were in play made it really hard for those young people to get out? Language barrier, correct, right? And Alicia, it looks to me, you know, they speak Spanish in their interviews or you know, but do you think they spoke English in their time on the uh, farm or, <laughs> right? I doubt it. I, they were working with each other. The traffickers were, you know, Spanish speaking. I doubt they had any opportunity to pick up even minimal uh, right. words, English words. Right. Yeah. So if they had run away, right, it, they would be unable to communicate unless they're a Spanish speaker. Uh, so, so I think, yeah, language barriers is huge. That's, I think, something that's uh, real. Didn't know where they were, I think is accurate. I mean, they were picked up at some detention center we see maybe, who knows, you know, and brought by someone, their guardians, their, you know, phony guardians to the trailer, right? Uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's they probably, yeah, we don't, they, it's probably very likely they didn't know exactly where they were. Uh, employers were their landlords, absolutely. We see that. So there's also, so, yeah. Uh, that's easily uh, a factor for them. Um, what about um, money? I mean, did they, let's say they had run off. Did they have money in their pockets? I am, or what, what, are there any other factors you guys saw? We've talked about a few of them. Yeah, Kathy, great uh, point about the sheriff, right? We see, yep, and Lynn, no energy after a long day, right? Yeah, and who knows where the closest place, closest store or gas station, or, right, Alicia, to, to that farm. It appears from the shots we see that it's quite, it could be incredibly rural, very long way, right? Right. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think I had the same reaction to where we see that interaction with the reporter and the ex egg guy and and she would have yeah the sheriff said it does from what we hear on that mic that uh yeah he appears to maybe be friendly with the business owners and uh yeah maybe not worthy of the their trust absolutely i think that's a common thread uh probably no perhaps no spanish speakers in that uh yeah on that sheriff's team that would have uh, just not been a, a good candidate for them to try and talk to, even if they did see them, maybe, you know, driving by perhaps one day. Yeah, yeah I think these are, go ahead, Alicia. Fear. Yeah, right. <laughs> what it just, yeah, absolutely. It's a pretty obvious one, but it's a, I think, thank you. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, so all these things that and the lack of phones we've talked about, the locate all these things. So these are the kind not every trafficking situation is the same. You can be trafficked for labor in a city, you know, where there are more people around. You can be in a domestic working a restaurant. I, I did a yeah, a case in New York City. It was rest back in the house restaurant workers who um, you know, so it doesn't always have to be remote, it's always the same. It can really it's really case by case. Right. Uh, 
domestic workers in draft. Yeah, absolutely. There's no, yeah, I would love for you all to remember. We're focusing on this fact pattern tonight because this is a really compelling story that illustrates trafficking, but it can happen so many ways. There's no one type of, uh, of trafficking. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's see. Go and, and so like, I guess my last quizzing question for the night. Tell, so, you know, once they made that call, we, we see what happens next. We, we get to see the you know, the, the defendant, the, the, what appears to be the, you know, the guilty uh, coordinator of it all. Um, but then we hear, you know, the, at the end, we start to hear what, what happens to those boys, right? When the story ends and their part in the cross, you know, cross criminal case maybe is over, they get immigration relief. I think they get some kind of visa. I think, Alicia, did you catch which kind they got? I think it was you or T, I'm not sure. They got some kind of status in this country, right? So if these boys were, you know, one of the many, I'll, I'll hand it over to Alicia. One of the many things that these uh, these victims in this case needed were an excellent free immigration lawyer to help, you know, sit down with them, Alicia. So just, you know, very briefly, right? Mm -hmm. If you were connected with them, you know, what what were the kind, of, what would be the first uh, kind of things that you would be discussing with them in the first meeting? What would you, what would the evaluation look like? So the screening would start with the elements of human trafficking uh, for uh, the T visa application. And then it would consist of just making sure that they have the elements that they need, which are, um, it was taught to us um, as process means and end. And you only need one per column. So the process is recruiting, harboring, transportation, obtaining or providing. Um, and an example of transportation does not have to be from one country to another, from a state to a state. That's a misconception that for um, human trafficking, sometimes it's people, you, you brought somebody from a, a different nation or a different state. It can be you transported them from work and back home and back to work. It can be um, the, har uh, the harboring is also um, keeping somebody and does not require movement um, and obtaining. Obtaining is uh, a parent sells a child. Right. Um, and then the means is by force, fraud or coercion. And we went into that and you, you only need one per column. And then the end is for the purpose of involuntary servitude debt bondage or slavery or sex trafficking. It's just one of those. And then basically there's a few other elements that you have to make sure you can cover and you move from there. Yeah. And then um, you would assess the situation. For example, I would assess uh, what, what were their living conditions right. before this happened? Who did they live with? Were they with mom and dad? And if not, why not? Had they been abandoned by one of the parents? Because unfortunately, it's very prevalent in these tribe countries that I usually um, work uh, with is uh, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. So abandonment and neglect and abuse by one or both parents is very prevalent. And so I would just screen these uh, juveniles for any kind of relief that they may qualify for. Right. So find, yeah, find the relief that best fits them, go with that. All right, so then where Alicia's job ends and the job of a service provider, you know, begins, right? There's a lot of other things that would make, you know, Alicia's job easier and, and support these, you know, victims as they, you know, begin their healing journey, as we, we say it, I think, in our field. Uh, what are some of the other things that they, those kids needed? Anyone want to put some thoughts in the chat? I mean, so they, you know, hopefully, you know, quickly get hooked up with a great free or, you know, uh, free, excellent immigration lawyer. Someone sit down and, you know, because I am, you know, out of status, I'm dazed, I'm, a, you know, just out of a really traumatizing situation. Uh, but one of the problems I need help with is, uh, you know, how am I going to stay in this country? Is where am I going to live? And so if I'm going to stay here, I need legal status. So I need to begin the, pro and Alicia, I, I imagine one of the first things you, you tend to do is manage to teach them the timeline, right? That it's not, 
don't get your visa or green card ever the next day, right? When you're an immigrant. And, and speaking of timelines, okay. for um, T visas, there's no statute of limitation. And what basically that means is there's no uh, filing deadline. However, obviously you want to get this uh, filed as soon as possible because, um, you know, so many circumstances can happen, you know, it's just the sooner the better for these victims to get this process uh, on the right. way. But yeah, but there's no statute of limitations in case anybody comes across somebody that may have experienced this a while ago. Right. Yeah, if they meet the other elements, they qualify still. Right. Yeah, well, in, in short, victims of trafficking need a ton of things besides a great, if they're an immigrant, besides a great lawyer, they need, you know, very basic things that an, another homeless person needs. They need a really great, safe place to stay and, an, you know, immediately. And then they need longer term options. They need money. They need emergency. Every service oh. provider in the trafficking field um, go, uh, do you, would uh, need that, or would have that, and it'd be part of what they give out. Uh, so basic things, clothes, everything, you know, they lived in a really, you know, they, they have probably very little with them. Uh, they need access to, in addition, Alicia, you teed up the psychological harm. They need therapy. They need, uh, they also need just doctor. I mean, so they probably have injuries that went untreated while they were working there. They need doctors. A lot of, um, you know, probably didn't go to the doctor or dentist once, right? Right? None of the you know, usual care for a young person appeared to happen in the story. So they have a lot of backdated medical, dental, you know, and psychological needs that need, need uh, uh, so a good um, service provider like Turnaround is who we work with or anywhere in the country. There's a lot of good service providers out there. They're going to try to wrap around and really serve the whole person. So the lawyer is a huge uh, piece of it, but they can't do it all, right? And they, uh, so, we, so we need the other pieces of the puzzle to be uh, fully resourced and ready to go to serve uh, longer term. Yeah, probably help going to college. If, the, if those, it sounds like those young people are still in the US, they need education and jobs, all the things that any other young person needs. Uh, so I think I will, I will stop the quizzing there and let's, uh, let's just open it up, Alicia, if it's okay to some of these questions we see in the chat and any others. Uh, about this story, you know, we, we haven't talked about it. We tried to teach you a little bit of what we saw amounts to the trafficking. Uh, but this story is really compelling. There's a lot of uh, crazy stuff. Certainly that trafficker we see is really uh, hard to you know, watch, but uh, interesting to listen to, you know, how he seems to dodge responsibility. Uh, so feel free to put any, you know, raise any other questions or comments you all have. I'm gonna, uh, we have a great one I'm going to go back to from uh, Mr. and Ms. Monteith. I apologize if that's your first name, but it looks like a last name to me. Uh, mm -hmm. your, your question is, how can you tell if the producers of the products you buy, like Trillium Farms, use workers who are victims of trafficking? It's a really good one. Um, so that is, some, that is a question like Brianna and I uh, think about. So in short, uh, check back my web, our office's website. Brianna can drop it in the chat if she hasn't already. Um, there are some good lists of, you know, like I'm buying a product X, I want to check on how good it is on its labor chain. There are some really good, Rihanna may be able to recall some of the websites and apps, but our U.S. Department of Labor has, I think, taken, as they should, taken some good steps forward and creating a lot of good resources for us as individual consumers uh, to educate ourselves before we buy something, if we want, or just, you know, if we see a company in our community, right? Like, and we just want to know, you know, we just want, you're curious about it. Uh, you can go online, basically, if you have access to a computer, um, and internet, you can, uh, do some of this research yourself now. It's usually generally through the Department of Labor website. Um, and so Brianna will to follow up with us. And, uh, also, you know, I think we, if we don't already have a link to it on my website, it'll be there pretty soon. That's definitely something, you know, it's kind of like a micro action, you know, we all can take if we're not lawyers or uh, advocates, we can all be as informed a consumer as we can. And we can choose not to give our business to uh, businesses that don't have good labor practices, right? So thank you for that question. I think it's a great one. That's uh, it's a great example of something, you know, we can all be thinking about more and more. Uh, let's see. Alicia, do you have anything, any other, feel free to just jump in on, on any of my stuff if I'm saying here. Let's see, Sarah Cochran. Sarah, I'd like to shout her out. She's one of the 
like founding members of the Howard County Human Trafficking Prevention Coordination Council. She runs a gas, has been involved with Cocoa Gas, uh, as a few uh, other folks here ha um, tonight have been. So thank you for uh, your participation as always, Sarah. Let's see. Until, yeah, the, the, until each company is held responsible for the means of hiring and treatment of its workers, the company will be able to say, I didn't know about that, right? That last, the very end, if you remember, we find it seems like the company finally decides to go on camera after the lawyers probably wouldn't let them for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. do you, what did you guys think of that, like VP? I forget what it, you know, and he's like, mm -hmm. seems to say, I just, I just didn't know, right? It was, did you guys believe, did you find him trustworthy? Did you believe him or did you think they knew? You know, he said, I was just, he said, like, I was just looking at the quality of the work. I didn't care about the worker. I just wanted to see that, the, you know, the, that's how he put it. What do you think, Alicia? So in my opinion, even if he didn't know, he should have known. And not wanting to know or caring to know means you knew. Right. Because especially as the VP, you want to make sure all your employees and the contractors are being treated fairly. So by you not knowing, that that's just, I think, I, that. I don't even know how he would go on camera and say that he didn't know. I know. It's very curious about the conversation with their lawyers at that point. I mean, I, I, my suspicion, my guess is perhaps at that point they were satisfied that criminal charges, the sentence, you know, the cases were done and that they could speak a little and just be a little bit apologetic. Uh, but I, yeah, I found him very interesting. You, thank you, Alicia, for reminding me though, a huge red flag for me in all trafficking cases we see here, it's excessively, is the use, when we see a company and laborers from Latin America, generally, we see it right here in Maryland, definitely. And we see a third party in the middle, a contractor, a labor contractor, a hiring company. This guy was like, you know, Haba, Haba is what it was called, or Mr. Dudan and his brother and associate. You know, so it gave Trillium the, you know, or and DeCoster before them. I, you know, I think they were very compelling too before it went so corporate and maybe, maybe more white collar than at least in appearance. Um, that, you know, the, the recruiter, the, this, this middle, middle man shows up and said, I can solve your problem. Can't find people to take your jobs, you think, right? Or maybe, you know, we'll see if that holds to be true over time. I can help you with that problem. I can fill your labor force with these, you know, just, just hire me, I'll take care of it. And then you, you know, so it's, that is a common thread a lot of nationally is the use of a recruiter, some in-between party. Um, so I would urge ever, you know, uh, you know, not it's something to just be aware of and, you know, in your lives going forward, if you ever happen to hear of a business, it's not always a bad recruiter. There are absolutely good staffing companies and recruiting companies, but we see them in Howard County. We see them right here in Maryland. Some of the employers, certainly on the Eastern shore, I think some of those big, like we have chicken farms, we have crab fishery, uh, crabbing, uh, bigger agriculture slatterings than we do here. Uh, but the use of recruiter is a, is a, is a cause for concern for me. Um, let's see. Yeah, the, so Lynn didn't care. Yeah, didn't come across as a company that cares. The factories, trailers, etc. We're not up to par. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. So you're not buying it. You think they knew? Both Trillium. It seems like DeCoster. What about the first guy before it went to Trillium? We hear him, his old like right hand man say a really like pretty you know entrenched thing I, I you know I think in this country unfortunately we'll see hopefully it'll go away but that you know his opinion he says very plainly that Mr. DeCoster the man who ran the egg farm you know thought that the you know it was fine that they that the you know it's a better life than they could have in Mexico or whatever you know the country of origin right and so mm -hmm. and that, that seemed to be like you know what the, the thought process what do you what do you say to that Alicia? Um. I think that was just for the cameras. I don't see anybody believing that <laughs> those conditions are better than what you have in your country. It's, yeah. it's, or, or justifying that bad behavior. We can always find a way to justify our bad behavior. And I think that's the way they justified it. Ooh. Not taking accountability, responsibility, or acknowledge, even acknowledging reality. Yeah. I hear you. 
I mean, what about, I know I'm not a farmer and I don't believe you are either, Alicia, but, uh, you know, if any of you are, please go ahead and uh, chime in. But I, I've had these conversations since I've started here in Howard County. You know, what if, he does say something that I've heard right here in Howard, uh, you know, that it's hard to get Americans to fill these jobs. Uh, that it, the, the work is, I mean, he says, we see on video some really physical work, as he puts it, that, um, you know, and we, we do have certain types of visas or H2A, H2B visas that uh, any, you know, seasonal farmers, landscaping pool companies are allowed, they're designed for them to use to bring foreign workers in. And the one of the criteria, Alicia, like I've looked at it recently, Alicia, is I have, I confirm I cannot find an American worker for this job. I, uh, I, I tried, can't find, you know, so I must, so please allow me to have, you know, X amount of these visas bring and, you know, I'll do it right and I'll, I'll follow the rules, but I, I, sh I cannot find Americans. So, I mean, it's, it seems to have a validation in our immigration, at least the old relic, who knows how long it'll be around of our, in our immigration system. What do you, any feedback on this difficulty of getting Americans fill really difficult chicken farm jobs, even now in COVID? I, I don't know. I don't know. What if they were paid twenty dollars an hour, twenty five dollars an hour? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I hear you. Yeah. So Lynn and uh, Sarah, you guys aren't buying it. You're. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He's a. Dirt. I think you're. I think Alicia. People are agreeing with you. It's just a, just a something they're saying, right? Yeah. yeah. Well. Yeah. Lie to themselves. Sleep at night. Cage. Good. Sarah. Yeah. Joke of the night. Yeah. Agreed. Cage free eggs. Are gonna be in all of our diets after watching. If you watch the whole thing, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah it shows a pretty you know physical workplace. It's just, um, so all right. It is eight guys. I am so the way we design this is we could you know continue. I'm happy to continue taking any questions or feedback. Um, but we and I'm available till eight thirty. We can keep chatting if anyone has any other comments. We can also wind it down. I know we're a smaller group here. Alicia, do you have any, um, you know, final words, any final comment on this documentary? Just that um, a misconception too is that trafficking had to occur to someone who was brought here under, you know, fraud, force, or coercion, and that's just a misconception. Um, it, how you came or why you came can have, uh, shifted and become a trafficking situation once you're here and that would qualify a person as a uh, human trafficking victim for a tv sub um, purposes so it's just not being brought to this country to um you know serve as a a slave or or you know a labor or anything it's it could have happened once you're here so. right yeah, I think that's one of the first things that I remember learning in law school and trafficking is you can, while we, we often focus on this international right. case just like this, it's that it's not required usually under the the, the law, federal or, or local law, perhaps on trafficking. There's so, no, you can be trafficked right in your hometown by someone you know in your childhood bedroom. There's no traveling, even across county, you know, no movement requirement. You can, right. uh, it's not an for element. TV, of, for a T visa, it, that element has to be met that it's on the count of. Right. So, and, and that, that's a huge, more complicated discussion. But. Right. Okay, some good questions, uh, Kofo. Uh, yeah, there's a different, no, you know, no, you're raising something of interest to me and, in, you know, our office, our task force, we've talked about, you know, the fact that, you know, the discrepancy in understanding your work right to the laborer in, in this country. An American may know, yeah, what minimum wage is or that I, you know, basic, some of the basics that perhaps uh, other uh, migrant workers aren't as aware of uh, overtime, extra hours. There's also a lot of different rules for different workplaces. Like if you work at an amusement park, there's different labor law under the state law. If you work at a farm, there's different laws. There's uh, seasonal workers are allowed to be paid less uh, to, on these special visas. So it's just a lot of um, something we're, we're gonna, we're attentive to in our office, trying to put some more information on our website about to, uh, and just start, start 
you know, the teaching ourselves a little bit more about how different workplaces are allowed to operate right now. Um, so, it, yeah, and in short, I, um, I do think that migrant workers, you know, like these, in this setting we see in this documentary, yeah, one good thing that someone could do is if, if possible to reach them outside of work, maybe at some safe location, if, if it's not of controlled of a day and a setting, uh, to, to meet them where they are, you know, someone who speaks Spanish, who's friendly, who's not a policeman and doesn't have, you know, police looking clothes on, uh, you know, somewhere we have advocacy organizations that are great in our area, places like Casa, Luminous, other, you know, advocacy or just nonprofit grassroots groups, uh, just try to meet people where they are, you know, this, this type of workers that do it with Spanish speakers probably, and, you know, share some information, try to, if possible, talk to them about their rights that you, yeah. So you don't have to work 16 hours a day. You're supposed to get a lunch break, you, you, more than five minutes. Um, you know, just try to inform just the way us Americans get to know our rights. But, um, that's an outreach to migrant workers, knowing your right, teaching them a little bit more about the rights and their resources available, uh, despite their immigrant, any immigration status uh, is absolutely, it's, it's something we're working on out of our office. It's definitely something I think that you know, law enforcement can't really do. It's where it's up to us on the civilian side to to start doing well, hopefully. Uh, Sarah Cochran's question next has have Howard County investigated any labor trafficking cases? I think there've been some, um, I'm aware of, Sarah knows I've been here about two years. I'm aware of some like tips about labor trafficking that have come in to law enforcement, to our police directly, to the federal investigators directly. Uh, I got one or two, you know, kind of like soft tips, calls in the path, uh, and then police, you know, they always investigate and, you know, look at them. Uh, and so to my knowledge, we pretty, we've never had a prosecution under state uh, trafficking law yet. It's a very new trafficking law in Maryland. Um, but I think there's been some initial tips received, investigations, and I know our our outstanding police is Vice and Narcotics Unit. They have a human trafficking section. They work, they have spent a lot of time as Brianna and I know this year, seeking a lot of training on labor trafficking, how to try and build those cases, do things maybe differently than they've done in the past, not the way they've always been done and try to pursue, you know, kind of new, new styles of investigation and leads proactively. So I think that that's where we are in labor trafficking cases. Um, and that's not to say that no one's applied for a T visa though. There's like, you know, it's important to understand there's criminal investigations, you know, put the bad guy like this guy we saw, Mr. Dudan, away, hopefully under federal or state law. But then even if no investigation happens, an immigrant, if they just get to a lawyer like Alicia, they can still, even if no one's ever prosecuted, there's still hopefully immigration relief for them. Um, Alicia, on that point, so T's, UV says, you see a lot of, you know, client, you probably can guess my question, right? Clients that are, have been a victim of a crime or a family, you know, has a T visa, U visa, it's basically that you're eligible for those visas when you've been trafficked or a victim of another crime here. Right. Right. Serious, pretty serious crime usually. How, but they're not, am I confirmed that I'm right, right? That there's no, not always, a prosecution of uh, or an investigation, right? And depending on the set, the county, the county, the jurisdiction we're in. How do um, you have any comment on that? How often you you see that? And how? So for the U visa, there has to be, but we haven't touched on um, on that. But that that's um, if you have been a victim of a, a qualifying crime in the United States, because it doesn't have. It's not every single crime that qualifies you for the U visa and that you've cooperated with law enforcement. So the U visa and the T visa is pretty much, we're gonna help the victim, but then this is also a way for the authorities right. to help the perpetrators and um, prosecute them. And they can't prosecute them if they don't have a victim. And so this is encouragement for the victims to come out and speak up regardless of their status here in the United States. So um, for example, even if you entered uh, with some kind of visa and you were trafficked here, or um, you're here undocumented and um, you were a victim of one of these qualifying crimes, 
you don't have to worry about your legal status because these visas were intentionally made to not only help the victim, but to help the government so that they can address um, the different crimes that are occurring, address human trafficking, and put a stop, well, a attempt to uh, help the undocumented population with being victims of crime and feeling like they have no recourse in the legal system. Thank you. Yeah, I think Valerie Harvey is right. The trust is essential on all this. And uh, mm -hmm. I think in general service for what I, what we like see, we see a lot in our community as a, as a best practice is hopefully, you know, when police and victim services providers are, are dealing with the, the same person, you know, victim trying to investigate the case and also have that person be served well and rebuild their life. Uh, you know, so to communication, ideally from police, if, if possible, or the, the federal law enforcement, if it's federal or state, uh, you know, if, okay, prosecution and investigation, then a prosecution is not going to have to go forward, you know, trying to communicate back to the, at least the service provider, maybe not the victim themselves, depending on the situation. Uh, but sometimes, you know, the follow up between on, on the criminal investigation is uh, something I think we like to see, you know, try, build stress absolutely between, you know, immigrant communities and law enforcement, as well as, you know, service providers and law enforcement. That trust is also really important to us. Right. Uh, and we enjoy a really good one where we have beautiful foundation in, in Howard County of our police, our partners there, as well as our service providers. So we're trying to keep that going for sure. Um, um, Mr. Ms. Monty, where can we find volunteer opportunities? Thank you for asking. Uh, so uh, Brianna can reshare it again in the chat. Uh, our office's website, uh, it, it, you know, keep checking that. In short, um, volunteer, we, we aren't in our office offering a lot of opportunities right now. COVID has, has you know, limited a lot of in-person work. We tend to, when people want to volunteer at all, kind of in the name of human trafficking, uh, we tend to recommend a, a really good service provider. Uh, they, uh, like, uh, like Hope Works is right here in Howard County, they do uh, great work with domestic violence systems. They have a volunteer program sometimes. I, I think it's kind of taking a break during COVID while in person was so limited. Turnaround is in Baltimore and Howard. Uh, they have volunteer opportunities. So Brianna, come keep dropping those organizations in the chat for me. Turnaround. Also, Araminta is based in Baltimore City. They have a lot of virtual training. They are an outstanding place to look into volunteering. They have a really uh, and the reason I say so is because they have a really robust training program for volunteers. Uh, what you may find um, if and when any of you want to volunteer uh, with a service, like a direct service organization, is they're not going to just let you do that. A good one is not going to be like, yeah, go, you know, talk to this victim, you know, over here, or drive them to an appointment. There's a little bit of vetting and, and a preparation that goes into it, uh, for, depending on the roles that the tasks you might be assisting with. Um, Certainly more, more soft stuff like donating goods uh, is always useful for, for these organizations. So I'd encourage you to check out Turnaround, Araminta, also Hope Works. Um, certainly there's other, I mean, Alicia, am I missing others that just do good work with immigrants? There's CASA, there's Lumina. Um, Luminous is local. Right, yeah. CASA has a um, Power County organizer, but yeah, their presence I think remains in uh, no, no big uh, office presence here in the county. So I would, um, th that's in, that's my short answer to you about volunteering as I'd look to those organizations. And if you're also interested in joining us for human our Howard County Task Force meeting, our Human Trafficking Prevention Coordination Council, those are public meetings. We have them about every other month. We have full ones and then we uh, have one small committee of a lot of like Sarah Cochran, a lot of, uh, you know, members of the general public with interest and in helping with raise awareness. They join that committee. That can, all those meetings are available on our website. Brianna uh, is huge in helping run them and schedule them and write. So we post them, the, the WebEx links for the virtual meetings are all there. So I would uh, I would start maybe if you'd like join us for a meeting, you could check out the minutes of our, on our website, see the kind of things we spend our time talking about. Um, and then look to those great organizations we have in our area that uh, could use volunteers. All right. I miss any Valerie. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. Valerie Harvey is an expert, whatever she says, in addition to uh, Alicia. Great. All right. 
any other questions as we I'm happy to, to stay on if but uh, there aren't any more. I, all right, I don't see any more, right, Brianna or uh, Becky, we're good. All right, cool. Well, um, the, Brianna, would you drop our email addresses into the chat, please, for Alicia? Is it okay if I, I put your absolutely your there? Yeah, um, Alicia. Again, this is Alicia Altamirano. Altamirano. Uh, immigration attorney extraordinaire and advocate and member of a lot of county bodies doing good work. I think she's she's happy to stay in touch if any of you would like. And I am certainly um, on all things human trafficking and getting involved or just learning more, repeating this. If this content is interest, really interesting to you, if you'd like, uh, we can certainly repeat it in other times and uh, tailor. Basically, we can bring a presentation to any group anytime. We can make it really short, we can make it just 15 minutes, we can make it an hour. Um, we can, you know, we can tailor it to a lot, any community group with interest. So uh, do, do feel free to, to follow up with me, Brianna, anytime on that front. Uh, cool, well, thank you. Thank you all for joining. I, I, um, I think it blew by it's some important things at the very beginning, thanks to Becky. Uh, to our partners at the library for for hosting putting this this evening together and making the documentary available on your can it's still available right it's not going anywhere becky it's on canopy for indefinitely so. indefinitely yeah go go ahead log on you just need a library card um if you don't have a number let us know we can get you one awesome cool well i uh alicia thank you so much for your time and all your great wisdom tonight brianna uh, and everyone who's here, thanks for taking time on a, a, a weird month and a, and a weird time of a really cold month where you could have been watching, binging anything else on Netflix and uh, you spent time listening to us talk about trafficking. So uh, I commend you for your, you know, your interest and, in, you know, in joining us for this conversation and um, we would love to stay in touch anytime. Don't be a stranger. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Andrea. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Alicia. Right, good night, everyone. Take it easy. Thanks, Becky.